Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today. We'll start with our session now. Uh, my name is Martha Stickings, and I work for the European Union Agency for Fundamental Rights. Uh, we're really delighted to be co-organizing uh, this session on tackling hate speech online, ensuring human rights for all, uh, with our friends from the Council of Europe. Um, and uh, I'm delighted to have uh, Charlotte altenhörner dion as the co-moderator for the session. Uh, this is actually the first of two joint workshops uh, for our organizations today. Um, there's another on AI rights and wrongs, who is responsible, uh, this afternoon at 3 o'clock uh, in Convention Hall 1D. So we would also encourage you uh, to come along to that session uh, if you'd be interested. Um, the European Union Agency for Fundamental Rights, or, or FRA for short, um, is a agency, an EU agency um, tasked with collecting data and evidence on the situation of fundamental rights in the European Union. Uh, and we provide evidence-based advice to EU institutions and member states. We have a wide mandate uh, covering the full range of rights that are set out uh, in the EU Charter. Uh, but of course, like many organizations, uh, we see that digital issues, um, including, of course, the protection and promotion of fundamental rights online, uh, are increasingly cutting across our work. Uh, so as uh, as an example, we currently have a large-scale project uh, looking at artificial intelligence, big data, and fundamental rights, uh, where we're trying to collect uh, use cases across different sectors, whether that be health, insurance, public authorities, law enforcement, uh, financial services, to assess the positive and negative impact uh, of the use of algorithms uh, for decision-making. Um, today, in fact, we're also launching a report on the use of facial recognition technology by law enforcement agencies. We have some copies uh, of that report at our stand in the IGF village, uh, and it can also be downloaded from our website. Uh, we've also looked at some other um, issues in this area. Uh, earlier this year, we published at the request of the European Parliament a legal opinion on the proposed EU regulation on preventing the dissemination of terrorist content online. Uh, and we also collect uh, data on experiences of hate speech uh, and the enjoyment of uh, fundamental rights online through our large-scale surveys. Turning to the topic of today's session, um, why are we focusing on tackling uh, hate speech online? I think there are three main reasons for that. Uh, the first is, of course, that online hate speech is a profound problem, um, that many, many people are the targets um, of abuse, uh, and whether that be through language, images, video, um, online. And that can be racist, xenophobic, anti-Semitic, Islamophobic, homophobic, transphobic, sexist, ageist, uh, or target persons with disabilities. We saw, for example, uh, from our Violence Against Women survey uh, in 2012 that one in 10 women had experienced cyber harassment since the age of 15. Uh, and that figure rises to one in five uh, women between the ages of 18 and 29. Uh, our survey uh, looking at the experiences of Jewish people in the EU showed that anti-Semitism is most commonly expressed online, especially through social media. Uh, and nine in 10 respondents said that expressions of anti-Semitism on the internet uh, have increased in the past five years. The second reason uh, is that online hate speech is such an important issue from a fundamental rights perspective. In terms of rights themselves, it really engages the full range of fundamental rights, uh, striking at the core of human dignity, um, but also at its most extreme, it can really uh, threaten the right to life itself. But of course, it also engages other rights from privacy, data protection, freedom of expression, protection against discrimination, uh, as well as rights related to remedies and redress. 
but it also presents challenges about how we try to uphold those rights. Uh, and that's some of the discussion that we'll be having this morning uh, in terms of effective uh, instruments in a global environment, about the respective roles and responsibilities of different actors in this process, and about the question of scale and how to deal with the huge volume uh, of data that is available and shared online. And thirdly, that this is an area where there are already a huge number of initiatives that are either recently completed, uh, currently underway, or are planned for the near future, whether that be at the UN level, the Council of Europe, the European Union, the national level, uh, with civil society and with business. Um, and we'll hear about some of those initiatives uh, from our speakers in a minute. And we really hope that this discussion can contribute um, to some of, uh, some of those initiatives. Uh, and that leads me uh, on to introduce the speakers this morning. We're really delighted to have such uh, eminent speakers, uh, and particularly, I have to say, such eminent female speakers um, to, uh, who are involved in these issues in different ways. Uh, I will start uh, introducing actually our male speaker first, as he's the only one, uh, and that is Matthias Ketterman, um, who since the 15th of January this year um, has been head of the research program on regulatory structures and the emergence of rules in online spaces uh, at the Leibniz Institute for Media Research. Uh, then we also have to my left uh, Louisa Klingbaal, um, who works for Directorate General Justice and Consumers at the European Commission um, and who has been um, working in part of the team uh, managing the code of conduct on illegal um, online hate speech that the European Commission has developed. Um, we also have uh, Salua Gazuni Ulasti, and I apologize for my pronunciation, um, who is the regional director of the Article 19 MENA office um, and who has been uh, working on non governmental and uh, in non governmental and multilateral organizations um, on these issues for a long time. Uh, we also have uh, Alex Walden, uh, who is the global policy lead for human rights and free expression at Google. Um, and then last but certainly not least, uh, our final speaker is unfortunately not in the room with us, uh, but is participating online. Um, and that is uh, Leticia Avia, uh, who is a member of the French Parliament um, and is the rapporteur um, for the legislation on regulating uh, online hate that is currently um, proceeding through the French Parliament. Um, just before I hand over to the first of our speakers, just to say two quick words um, about how the session will work. Um, we will have quick uh, introductory um, interventions from each of the speakers, uh, and then we will open up the discussion to the audience, um, which will be moderated by uh, Charlotte. And we really encourage you to contribute um, to the discussion and ask questions um, of our panelists. Uh, so, without further ado, um, I would like to hand over to Matthias, um, who will start us off with his intervention. Thank you very much. Um, fighting hate speech online is perhaps the, the most challenging uh, aspect of online regulation. It is because it invokes both individual rights and social cohesion, the two key dimensions that we need to secure to build a um, sustainable online communication sphere. What we have seen over the last years is that uh, private communication spaces have become increasingly important for public discourse. In those spaces, primarily private rules apply. However, uh, even if these rules are slowly getting more accountable, we need to ensure that fundamental values that we as an international society have agreed on are ensured in private online spaces. One approach that the Council of Europe has taken to provide for, uh, for norms ensuring that is a recommendation on uh, 
um, intermediaries and their roles and responsibilities. The approach that the Council of Europe took was to um, ensure that we base all our policies on the primary responsibility of all states to respect, protect, and ensure human rights for all of their citizens, uh, be they offline or online. But that alone is not enough. The recommendation also refers to the important role of intermediaries as providers of online communication spaces. In doing so, and commensurate to their role, their importance for the public discourse, we make, have to make sure that intermediaries also respect human rights. We can do that by either applying as a frame the public laws that we have, the fundamental rights guarantees as a backdrop, and additionally by engaging actively with all stakeholders to develop uh, nuanced rules that answer to the peculiarities of online discourses, which are different from offline discourses, just as the European Court of Human Rights has confirmed in, in its jurisprudence, especially the speed of online communication, the virality of online communication may uh, necessitate uh, uh, a, um, a, more, a more nuanced application of uh, human rights in online spaces. What is essential, however, is to make sure that all activities that states take towards regulating intermediaries are based on law. We should be very critical of attempts to, to whitewash uh, policies by uh, relying solely on, uh, on, 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 on voluntary standards without a clear backdrop of normativity, a clear backdrop of uh, fundamental rights guarantees. If we are able to achieve that, that I'm sure we can uh, solve the, the big problem of fighting hate speech, of ensuring individual human rights and providing for a space where social cohesion uh, is uh, supported and not endangered. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Matthias. Uh, and now, um, if hopefully the technological uh, things are working properly, then I would like to um, give the floor to Ms. Avia, um, who is joining by video link. Can you hear me? We hear you very well. Thank you. So, as it was said uh, before, I, I believe there is um, a real need and a real emergency when it comes to fighting uh, hate speech. And as uh, state uh, representatives, we have two requirements. First, to make sure that the freedom of speech um, is protected. And the second point is to assure the protection of every citizen, and in particular, um, all the internet users regarding hateful or illegal content. So in France, we took the initiative to uh, build a new law. Um, this is a law that is uh, mainly inspired by what um, the German uh, uh, did with some other mechanism. So we try to have a very, very balanced mechanism to protect uh, freedom of speech and protect people who are targeted by um, hateful content. So the law that uh, is debated right now uh, at the parliament, which was voted uh, at the uh, French Assembly in July and it's gonna be at the Senate in a few weeks, um, it has two main points. The first one, the heart of the law, is um, the obligation for the big platforms to take down hateful content within 24 hours. Um, this is a new uh, crime that we created in the French law. And so if a platform, a major platform, which the one who has some vi uh, virality on its content. If this platform doesn't take down the content, um, can have uh, a fine that can go up to uh, 1.2 million euros. 
The second aspect is that we uh, uh, draw uh, several uh, means that each platform has to take to make sure they create all the condition so there will not be any hateful content on the platform. So the obligation to have uh, enough moderators, the obligation to have transparency um, regarding the means the, the use, the laws they use, the obligation to cooperate with the state for law enforcement. So then now we can pursue uh, the people who have all the uh, this hateful content. Uh, and some of our uh, uh, obligation of means, which have been supervised by our internet regulator, that is the CSA, and which can find up to 4% of the global income. So these are the two steps of this new regulation. It comes with uh, um, a broader regulation, uh, which has two aspects. The first one is to make the platforms more responsible. So that's the point of this law. It's to say that they are, not, they are not only holders of content. They, they, they have no passivity. They have uh, an action when they will uh, create the variety around the content. The second aspect is then to make people more liable for what they do online, and which requires that the platform will help us to find who they are physically. And the third aspect is more to make all the society more aware of um, this uh, situation and the fact that it starts usually with hateful content online and then it ends with hateful and terrorist acts on what people call the real life. Here's uh, for my uh, introductory uh, introducing uh, 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 statement. Thank you very much, um, and we hope you'll be able to stay with us also, because I'm sure there will be questions um, from the audience concerning uh, your work in France. Uh, and now I would like to turn to uh, Salua, please. Thank you very much for having me to also bring um, the MENA perspective on to this debate. Um, so let me uh, first of all start how hate speech is defined and understood in the context of my region. So hate speech is not understood and defined in the laws and policies in place as um, a speech that attacks uh, protected attributes uh, for people or for groups or individuals like um, national origin or gender identity or um, disability on, and so on and so forth. It is rather understood as a um, speech that attacks the symbols of the state, the national identity of the state, the um, security forces, the military forces. And this is why um, the regulation in place are not effective to counter hate speech and they are very um, dangerous for free speech. Freedom of expression in the MENA region is not recognized as a right to everyone. And without any um, um, precision in the laws, which are with vague notions, we are using vague, notion, vague notions in the laws to put people on jail without any um, guarantees to their rights. So here, any this Unfortunately, I have to say that these government's proposals to regulate online um, speech in the north, in the global north, are inspiring, can inspire countries in the global south with, unfortunately, maybe the, the, the bad aspects of those regulation or regulatory instruments. So the, the result will be to restrict more and more freedom of expression and we will not be able to um, protect those individuals and those groups whom our rights to freedom of expression is already um, not recognized. So they are already silenced by the society. So this is our concern. Article 19 has warned that those government proposals taking place um, in the European countries 
are um, threatening freedom of expression. So when it comes to the countries where freedom of expression is not recognized at, at all, so this is more and more uh, concerning for us. Um, what I also would like to add, so now the national um, regulations on place uh, in the MENA countries are the first uh, regula regulatory instrument is uh, justice. National courts um, have little knowledge about how online platforms are working, and they have little cooperation with online digital uh, online platforms. They don't know how they work and they don't know how they can have a dialogue with them. So if we look to the transparency reports uh, of international, of sorry, in, uh, digital platforms, we will see a little number of requests from the national courts in the MENA countries compared to countries in the global north. So this means that they don't have like uh, big knowledge how um, uh, digital platforms are working and how they can ask or can request to remove um, content when it is illegal. The other thing I would like to add also, I think that there is no, um, so there, are, there is a lack of transparency um, about how, uh, which rules how the rules uh, um, adopted by um, digital platforms are applied everywhere. So I think that there is um, inequality in applying the rules. Uh, so my impression, I'm understanding that in the MENA counties where we open dialogues with the members or the representative of digital platforms, we understand that they are not the people who are, who can take decisions. And so we have a lack of clarity how the rules are applied and who are, who takes decision, how um, content moderation is uh, ruled. And this is also something that concern, concern concerns us because we need to have the digital platforms themselves um, um, accountable, responsible, transparent, but also um, we need governments to be also responsible to their obligations to uh, protect uh, the right of freedom of expression for people and then educate them um, about any illegal content and how we can define this illegal content and then um, uh, restrict, their, uh, restrict their right to freedom of expression. We cannot start by restricting freedom, um, restricting or putting rules for illegal content before educating the society and recognizing their rights to freedom of expression. Thank you very much, Salua. Uh, and now I would like to turn to uh, Louisa Klingbaum. Thank you very much. I was asked in this session to touch on two. Uh, topics in particular. First of all, the role of voluntary collaborations to ensure the uh, removal of illegal hate speech. And secondly, how do we provide remedies when things go wrong? So if illegal hate speech is not removed or if legal speech is removed by mistake. So first on voluntary collaboration. In 2016, we adopted a code of conduct on tackling hate speech, together with Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Microsoft. Uh, and um, through this code of conduct, the companies have uh, committed uh, to reviewing notifications on uh, hate speech, not only against their own terms of service, so the rules that are applied uh, in, in terms of the um, content that is allowed on the platform, but also against national laws implementing the EU framework decision on co combating certain forms of racism and xenophobia. So this is a piece of regulation that requires member states to criminalize incitement to violence and hatred based on certain protected characteristics such as ethnicity, race or religion. Uh, to measure progress, we work with around 30 NGOs all over Europe, so in regular intervals they test whether these commitments are respected, uh, so they issue a number of notifications and then they see what the platforms do with them. Does it lead to removal? How long does it take to assess the content? What feedback do they get? According to our latest uh, evaluation that we published in January this year, the IT companies removed around 72% of the notifications that were, uh, of the speech that was notified to them. 
Uh, and this is quite good progress comparing to two and a half years ago when only 28% of the notified content led to removal. So the results of the Code of Conduct shows that hard law is not the only way to make progress in this area. Uh, soft measures can also help to address uh, big societal problems like illegal hate speech. And there's also certain advantages to this process, and I've already touched upon it. And the advantage is the collaboration that it can uh, trigger between civil society and the IT platforms. And why is that so important? Well, of course, when it comes to illegal hate speech, the legal demarcation line between protected speech and illegal hate speech is a fine one to, to, to balance. And it requires not only knowledge about the law, it also requires knowledge about the historical, semantic and regional context in which the hate speech is uttered. And that's, of course, where all of these NGOs working on racism and xenophobia in Europe have expert knowledge. So bringing them together with the IT platforms have been a really, really good thing to, uh, to enhance the quality of content moderation uh, policies. So we now see that they meet regularly, and after each a uh, monitoring session, they get together and bilaterally discuss individual cases that were difficult or that met with differences in interpretation. So the second theme, uh, what are the remedies? What happens when illegal content is not removed or when legal content is removed? So how do we sure, ensure that protected speech is not removed? Well, I think first of all, uh, governments uh, or regulators have to make sure that whether using soft measures like codes of conduct or regulation, uh, they, have to be, um, they have to be defined in a way that doesn't trigger the companies to over remove content that is also legal. Uh, to ensure this distinction, I mean, the Code of Conduct is obviously only uh, asking the platforms to remove content that is illegal and that is incitement to violence and hatred. Nevertheless, certain additional safeguards uh, can be put in place to ensure that we don't get over removals. In the Commission's horizontal response to tackling illegal content, uh, there's always been a dual objective. First and foremost, to ensure, of course, effective measures to tackle illegal content, but secondly, also to ensure protection of fundamental rights, including freedom of expression. And I think this dual objective is very clear in a recommendation on illegal content that we issued in 2018, in March. Firstly, the recommendation underlines the general call to, for platforms to act diligently in their content management policy. Uh, such diligence is particularly important when companies use automatized means for detecting illegal content, so essentially filters. And there, the recommendation really uh, asks the platforms to ensure that they have a human in the loop, human verification of the platform, of the content that is detected. Secondly, the uh, uh, recommendation uh, also uh, urges the companies to put in place systems for complaints, so-called counter-notice uh, systems, which would allow users to uh, complain if they are, um, uh, are having their content removed uh, wrongly. Uh, thirdly, we also ask that uh, the companies have transparency reports in place so that they show the public how they uh, use their uh, content moderation policies. In terms of victims, and I will stop with this, I would also like to recall that, of course, codes of conduct, removal of hate speech, this is just a complementary tool to law enforcement. I mean, for victims of online hate speech, of course, they should first and foremost be encouraged to report the offence to the police uh, and that the crime is actually investigated. And of course, also, also through this system, you can obtain an injunction for the removal of the content should this be necessary. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Louisa. Uh, and now, last but certainly not least, um, I'd like to hand over to Alex.
Thanks, um, and thanks for including us in the conversation. Um, so uh, I'm Alex Walden. I, um, my remit at Google is to work on, to ensure and advise the company on our commitments to human rights and free expression. Um, and especially doing that in the context of um, preserving human rights and free expression in the context of these complicated issues, including hate speech, terrorism, et cetera. So I spend a lot of time trying to um, engage with our product teams and our policy teams to ensure that our approach to these issues respects human rights while we are ensuring that we are um, being mindful of the way these issues are taking place in the real world. Uh, broadly speaking, the internet has been a force for good in the world. We see that it has um, increased access to learning and creativity and information, uh, and it supports the free flow of ideas. It's democratized who stories and how stories get told. And so that's something that we want to preserve in our approach to how we deal with these issues. We know that platforms can be abused, and therefore it's incumbent upon us to put systems in place to ensure that we're dealing with these issues effectively. That's why we are guided by local law, and we have a set of community guidelines in place um, that all of our users have to follow. Those community guidelines set the rules of the road for what is and is not allowed on our platform. And to be clear, all Google products have policies, all Google hosted content products have policies in place that prohibit incitement to violence, hate speech against individuals and groups based on their attributes, as well as harassment policies. We view all of that as all of those as grave social ills, um, and we want our policies to respond to them in the ways that the law requires. All of that being said, we have to figure out how to operationalize these commitments into ways that we are addressing the 500 hours of content that get uploaded on YouTube every day. How do we do that? The first way is that we have um, enforcement systems that start at the point at which a user uploads a video. Once a video is uploaded, we have technology that can detect whether or not um, content meets some of, our, some of the specifications through which we've trained it on hate speech. We can have users that flag that, and then content goes to a reviewer for them to evaluate whether or not that content meets our, um, meets our standards for hate. So investment in technology is an important aspect of the way that we address this content. But ultimately, we believe that the combination of humans and machines is the best way to ensure that we're respecting human rights in our approach to hate speech online. We know that hate speech is oftentimes context specific. It oftentimes can includes it, uh, imagery, but sometimes it's words. And some of those things are easier to train technology on. And so we have to be clear that um, technology can help us uh, address the volume of content, but it's not going to get us all the way. So we have thousands of reviewers around the world who are evaluating this content 24 hours a day, seven days a week to ensure that we're removing it as speedily as possible. We also have to ensure that we are um, training those reviewers so that they're taking into account the context of where the content is being posted, that they are accounting for the, the potential educational documentary artistic scientific value of the content so that we can be clear that we're leaving up content that has um, value, but we're taking down content that would otherwise constitute hate speech um, or harassment, et cetera. This approach is, um, I think similar approaches have been uh, taken up by the various of the large companies in the industry. Um, but kind of beyond that, we have all recognized that um, there are ways we can learn from one another. And so we've long collaborated across the industry on controversial content issues, hate, terrorism, um, child sexual ex exploitation, et cetera. Um, and so I think just sort of to harken back to um, the EU hate speech code of conduct, that's been an important way that the industry has um, engaged in a mechanism to both respect the law in countries where we do business um, and learn from it to improve the ways that we are operationalizing our own policies. So um, I think it's an important place to look um, when we're, when we're um, trying to demonstrate how self-regulatory mechanisms can work. Um, and then 
lastly, I'll just say um, it, what, just to kind of sort of pick up on what someone else said, um, it is important for all of us who are working on these issues to recognize that when we create models in this space, both from the company side as well as from um, the government side in terms of legislation um, or statutes, that we are creating examples that other governments anywhere in the world or companies will pick up on. And so to be mindful of the ways in which we are creating incentives um, and the, where there can be unintended consequences for that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have had fascinating speakers uh, on a very important topic. Um, again, my name is Charlotte Altenhöhner from the Council of Europe. I lead a small um, team on internet governance there. And uh, as you know, the Council of Europe has for decades tried to hardwire human rights into the decisions that we are taking on content moderation issues. And I think we have um, all an agreement here in the room that we want to ensure that freedom of expression and other rights that were mentioned are ensured, that users can use the internet in safety. But we have also heard a lot of different perspectives here in terms of how difficult it is to put that into practice. And I look forward to opening up the uh, discussion here. Please feel free for those of you who sit behind to come to the desk so that you can also use the microphone. Um, Last point, um, we have heard the different views here from governments that are indeed working uh, to tackle this issue from a rule of law, from a law point of view, which is very important. We have heard about um, soft law approaches that are important. We have heard about important, indeed, concerns uh, from the side of the civil society. And uh, we have learned about the importance of collaboration. Uh, the Council of Europe, of course, has tried to put that into a rule of law framework that uh, puts uh, the, the clear obligations of states on the one side and the responsibilities for uh, companies on the other. Um, I want to just put in the room the question which I think came up with your last point, Alex. Um, um, we have to, uh, we want to make sure that we apply with the law. I think we must also um, be aware that the internet, which has indeed been a great force for good, has certain aspects in its business models that do actually support the propagation of sensationalist um, content, often of hate, of um, incitement to violence, etc. There is also that um, aspect of the internet, and therefore, indeed, our responses have to be very forceful and effective. Can I invite the room to um, open up the debate, please? Very good. I will go down from here, please. Um, uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm uh, Bhavna from IT for Change, which is an NGO that works in Bangalore. And uh, I'm part of a project that's working on gender-based hate speech online uh, within the Indian context. Uh, and uh, uh, my question is, how do we uh, bring about, uh, as, as uh, Charlotte just mentioned, how do we create disincentives for um, you know the the harmful kinds of uh, the harmful ways in which uh, virality is uh, used on the internet um, to uh, pro to to make a hateful um, a speech uh, available across uh, uh, media? Um, how do we create disincentives and strong disincentives without creating um, mechanisms that uh, that uh, hold a, uh, social media platforms to account as publishers. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very good question. And um, I would like to now take five questions, if I can, please, uh, those that I've seen, and then we will give it back to the panelists, and then we will take the next five questions, I think. Yes, I saw you as well in the back. Thank you. Um. I'm Anupam Guha. I'm a faculty at Center for Policy Studies uh, from IIT Bombay, India. I work on AI policy. So uh, my question uh, to the panel is about uh, the more and more usage of machine learning technologies to moderate, uh, moderate speech and to sort of uh, enforce uh, 
standards by certain, uh, certain social media platforms. But what has often been seen is that by the use of machine learning to detect certain speech patterns, there is a sort of a attempt to uh, not have a corporate human responsibility. And what often gets lost with these algorithms is nuance, and that leads to various interesting social phenomena. One of them is, for example, brigading, wherein um, astroturfers, people who are politically motivated on a social media, can often, in, in a crowd, report a dissident, um, and this has happened a lot on, say, Twitter, and their accounts get suspended, and we have seen this multiple times. Also, what often happens is that uh, you sometimes have extremely toxic speech not detected by these algorithms because um, they are looking more at syntax than semantics, and this happens a lot in NLP. And because of a lack of trained human moderation, um, um, extremely toxic speech passes, but what might be genuine uh, free speech often gets uh, uh, often get suspended, especially if, as one of the panelists said, if the state itself has a malicious intent to um, go after certain speech. So uh, my intervention is that uh, how do we hold these companies responsible that while they have their claims of, moder uh, of moderation, that there should be sufficient trained human uh, humans in the loop and it should not be a techno-solutionist techno-solutionist manner of doing things. Thanks. Thank you. Please go ahead. And thank you. Uh, my name is Alexander Malkevich. I am a chairman of a media commission in the Civic Chamber of Russian Federation. And I want to, to mention uh, the hate speech because uh, we think that it's always uh, goes as an instrument of censorship on all social platforms and uh, other people uh, said something about this. Uh, we uh, need as a law for all those internet platforms to publish uh, all rules and definitions with concrete words uh, about hate speech, concrete words uh, which we cannot use in our uh, content, in our posts, not to be banned. Because nowadays we know that uh, everybody can be suspended, everybody can be thrown away from Twitter, YouTube, Facebook, because of so-called hate speech without any uh, red lines, without any concrete definitions. Uh, for example, moderator decided that this post is hate speech, but we have to know all words that we cannot use. And now uh, this so-called hate speech is uh, just a censorship to throw away those people uh, with views that uh, are not <laughs> correct for moderators of those platforms. For example, speaking about Twitter, uh, a month ago a new media project uh, appeared on this platform called Good News from Russia, and after six million uh, views uh, it was thrown away from Twitter without any explanation. Why? Because of hate speech? No, of course. But all those platforms, Twitter, Google, Facebook, they didn't answer uh, for thousands and hundreds of thousands letters from suspended users because they are too big and they are so great they didn't want to have a correspondence with those who are banned. So we need the special laws that uh, will put all those giants uh, on their right uh, place. Thank you very much. So two concerns in a row regarding the transparency and, and uh, uh, way of decision making in, in terms of hate speech. Please, I would have the gentleman uh, there and then, yes, you, thank you. And then we will turn back to the panel. Thank you. And my apologies, may I ask everyone please to limit themselves to the most uh, essential uh, part of the message. Thank you. Yeah, Giacomo Mazzone from the European Broadcasting Union. Um, I have a, a vested interest here. It concerns uh, the media, traditional media, and legacy media, or how you want to call. Um, when, uh, when it comes to the takedown exercise, we have many problems specifically in, in this, and many problems with the possibility to 
um, recourse ag against the decision. Um, just to give you uh, some elements, um, BBC take uh, an update number of uh, items that BBC produced that has been removed by the platforms and that are not anymore accessible through search engines, for instance. None of these items have never been notified to BBC because they were removed from a website of somebody for any reason, and the, the, the media that was originally producing that was never notified for that. So there is a case of censorship because hundreds, thousands of items that have been produced by traditional media that are accountable to the public become uh, invisible to um, a large mass of, of the citizens. Second problem we have is about uh, cyber harassment for journalists. We have a more and more case of attack, especially against women journalists, all around Europe, but not only in Europe, around the world, where through the cyber attacks you try to silence the journalists. So there are defamation, and sometimes this goes even in the physical sphere, in the real sphere, and there the platforms are not engaged in solving this issue. And the law, as Matthias mentioned correctly, is absolutely important, because for instance, in one country, in Finland, last year, there's been the first condemnation, not this year, the beginning of this year, there was the first condemnation in a trial for cyber harassment or journalists with the aggravation that was a journalist, that they were targeting that person because that person was defending the interest of the citizen to be informed. Last point that I want to raise is about the economics. Why, if, if now we are going to a takedown uh, approach, then explain me why traditional media they are still, if you publish the formation of Elena on a, a printed media, then I can go to jail, I can be fined according to the legislation in various country. If I publish the formation of Elena on Facebook or on Google, then nothing happens, simply I have to take it down in a reasonable terms of time. Why? Let me explain why. Then when I talk with colleagues from Facebook and Google, they say, ah, this costs too much. But then, I have 100,000 100, journalists in Europe that are paid exactly to do this every day in their work. And it costs a lot. The business model of the media is in danger because of that. Why the platform have not the same responsibility? So three simple questions. I, I hope to get a three simple answer. Thank you. Yes, lots of good questions. Um, please. Uh, hello, good morning. My name is Deborah Barletta. I'm a trainer in human rights education and I've been an activist of the No Hate Speech Movement campaign, which was initiated by the Council of Europe, so I'm familiar with their framework. So my question is uh, mostly to Mrs. Walden, because she's representing a company, uh, because when she said that um, they try to ensure that they train uh, their staff to recognize what hate speech is, if you're talking about training, so education, my question is uh, up to what standards, what, so it's similar to the question about the law requesting for the words, like what are the models you follow when you provide these trainings? What are your standards? What is your, uh, your understanding of its speech? Because also we heard from MENA countries, uh, for example, that uh, if there is no awareness, if there is no education, even if we have the law, uh, the way in which these are implemented and the way in which these affect the population can be more than beneficial, uh, actually problematic. So my question is, yeah, uh, what are your standards and what are your resources to provide this training and this uh, education for your uh, systems and for your um, like employees that are working on this topic. So thank you. Thank you very much for this question and we are giving back to the panelists. Uh, we had one specific question. Ms. Avia, I hope you're still with us and please let us know if you um, would like to get back to any of these questions. Okay. Uh. Okay. Um, uh, 
thank you for all this question. I think the, the debate is very interesting and it really puts the, the, the finger on where the, the major point is. Um, when, when you ask what, why the platforms do not have the responsibility, the liability, um, the same as a publisher or a journalist, I think it's here the heart of the discussion. Um, the legislation we have today is the one from the uh, European Directive from, from 2000, which says that the platforms are uh, simply host. But in 2000, uh, Facebook wasn't, uh, uh, did not exist yet. We didn't have any hashtag, we didn't have any tweet. Uh, it is a legislation that is not up to date at all, and it is a legislation that does not uh, does not answer the question of all those platforms who have an action in creating virality, because they decide the way they organize content, they decide the way they can accelerate the content, they decide the way they can push the content, and that's why their model is a model that will create. Uh, virality, and that's why they need to be more responsible. I believe we need to have three types of actors, the publishers, the host, and between them, what I call the accelerators, and those ones we need to, to reinforce their liability. Um, there were some questions about moderation. Uh, I've been working on this subject for almost two years now, and the fact is that I don't have any specific answer to this question, because the first question is, who are the moderators? Where are they? How do they work? And I can tell you that I can spend days and days with the platforms asking them to give me real number and certified number. I always have different answers. So I cannot tell you how many people moderate for a platform, where they are, how they, they are trained. I, I ask to all the platforms to give me their uh, training books so I will know which elements are used by the moderators to define what is illegal or not. And I never had these documents. So that's why in the French law, we have this provision which says that we'll have full transparency towards the regulators and we'll have all the information about the regulators, who, uh, who they are, how they work, how they use laws. Because the fact is that today, they are the one deciding what is illegal or not. And they should do that regarding the law. And we have in France uh, a very strong law about hateful content, which really defines that. And I can see that it is not this law which, which uh, is applied. So that's where I think the states have an input where they can create um, regulation that will really fit to the definition of hateful content that the, is within the, the national law, and then the regulation uh, should be organized around that with a full transparency of information from the platforms. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much. Uh, that was very helpful. Uh, I would like to give then to you and then maybe also to uh, Matthias. Okay. Um, I will try to keep it short so that I can touch on the variety of questions um, that relate specifically to YouTube or just to industry generally. Um, so the first question about addressing virality, um, I, I will leave it to others to comment on what, what um, statutory proposals they think might be best, but I will say from the product side, um, it's important for products to be designed in ways that we can address those within the product itself. And so we have made changes over the past year to ensure that we are removing content that is borderline, that is misinformation, that type of content from our recommendation algorithm to ensure that we are not amplifying content that is potentially problematic for these reasons, even if it doesn't violate our community guidelines. So that's just a piece about um, the product side. I'll leave it to others to comment on the regulatory aspect. Um, with respect to the question about humans in the loop, I will I'll say again, like from our perspective, the premise of our approach to combating hateful content online is that the best way to do that is a combination of humans and machines. And so that means that 
We use content classifiers to help us identify content, but determining whether or not content is removed is something that happens um, when a human reviewer takes a look at the content. And that is especially the case when we're talking about hateful content, where context matters in terms of how you interpret um, whether the content is violative or something else. Um, the question about um, publishing rules and specific terms that should be banned um, to have clarity for users. I think um, we certainly agree that we want to have as much clarity as possible and transparency for users around what our guidelines are for what they can and cannot post on the site. Uh, the challenge around that for us is that um, bad actors are uniquely motivated to create um, ever ever-changing ways of having dialogue around hate and extremism online. So you pick the five words that you can think of that any hateful group is using, and they will have modified and evolved those terms a week from now. And so it just, um, I think, specific terms is not the way that we are going to create clarity for users. Ultimately, those terms will inform the standards that we um, use to enforce policies across the platform, but um, a list of terms is not, um, I think, won't get us all the way there. Uh, I had all the questions written down, <laughs> and I lost it. Got it. Uh, so there was a question about transparency um, when content was, was removed from media. Um, any content that is removed from uh, YouTube pursuant to its community guidelines, the user receives notice from us. So I'm not sure what happened in that particular case, but it is the standard policy across the platform that when a piece of content is removed, the uploader is notified that it is. That's a different question of whether someone else is linking to somebody else's page. Um, that's sort of, uh, that's a next concentric circle out, but the uploader is notified when content is removed. Uh, with respect to um, cyber harassment of journalists, um, I just wanna flag two things. So one is that across our products, we have, harassment is prohibited on the platform, and that includes harassment against journalists. Um, and so the enforcement of that policy will not catch all of the ways in which journalists are harassed in, um, in ways that are cross-platform, um, but it's an important way for us to get at one piece of it. Uh, and then in other ways that we take this um, problem into account, we have something called the Google News Initiative that has a variety of ways that it um, supports the traditional media ecosystem. And one of the things that we do is we promote use of the advanced protection um, program that we have, which is um, an extra secure Gmail for uh, users who are most likely to be vulnerable, and that includes folks like, um, you know, political candidates as well as journalists, um, people who know that they are likely to be targeted. And so that's another way to kind of ensure that they have digital security as well. Um, and then the last piece about what standards are used to train the train reviewers, um, I just wanted to ensure, like, that we're clear about the way that we enforce our policy. So ultimately, um, the 10,000 people around the world who are doing review, who are human reviewers of the content that we remove, they're applying the YouTube community guidelines. And so they are trained on Google's enforcement policies of our guidelines. That's a separate matter from the ways in which um, the law is enforced across our, our platform. So content that is illegal and is having a, an evaluation of its legality is evaluated by a different set of um, folks internally who are part of a legal removals team. So just to kind of, I wanna underscore that there is a relationship between, there is certainly a relationship between the content that is illegal and the content that violates our platform, but they are sometimes separate. Thank you. So before I give to Matthias, I think we have two uh, new human rights themes just mentioned. One is, of course, the huge and growing group of a new work class, which is the content reviewers, who live often under rather difficult circumstances. And we all know that this is not only in, uh, in Google's headquarters, but it is also often in 
uh, in parts of the world where you need to hire people who know the local language, who know the the uh, the specificities. Excuse me, please. That's very bad. Um, the specificities of the local context. Uh, context. Uh, so that is one of the issues. And the other is, of course, the transparency. You responded to the transparency request saying that, yes, everybody is notified when something is taken down. They are, of course, not notified exactly of the reasons or of, of uh, they are not given. Um, there is, because it doesn't uh, comply with the terms and conditions. With the community is, guidelines, yeah, and it will cite it will cite the specific community guideline, yeah. and that also provides information about how to appeal the decision. Okay, good, fair enough. So, uh, aside um, uh, discussion regarding transparency, which co which of course is uh, an element of the rule of law as well, but Matthias. Um, thank you. Thanks for the uh, great questions. Allow me to brief comments on the uh, question of algorithmic. Um, content regulation and on uh, the possibility to reinstate content. So first of all, I am convinced that uh, the current discussion on the role of algorithms um, used in content moderation is very important. We have to know more about the data sets used on which they are trained and especially what these algorithms are optimized for. If they are optimized for attention, well, they will usually push edgy content. Companies have realized that it is not a sustainable business model to push edgy content because that, at the, in the long run, will uh, make people unhappy with being in that social sphere. So we need to come to a societal conclusion what kind of, uh, what, what, kind of what, 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 what the algorithms should optimize for. And I think they should be optimized for sustainable, dignity-based, enabling communication spheres. Um, European regulators, including the uh, German Ethics um, Commission, have called for a new media order uh, ensuring online diversity of opinion, just like with public broadcasters. That will be very difficult to implement because of constitutional and because of practical reasons, but this is at the horizon, and this is the, the backdrop against which we need to uh, talk about what automatic decision makings, which are essential for uh, alleviating the task of, of human moderators, uh, what they are optimized for. Um, it is also not true that you have no recourse against um, private moderation practices, at least in, in certain jurisdictions. Um, German courts have, at least for the last two years, offered the possibility to have content reinstated. They do so by applying fundamental rights directly between private parties, between, for instance, Facebook and users. In uh, May of this year, the German Constitutional Court uh, confirmed, for instance, that Facebook had to reinstate the profile of a right-wing party. Um, similarly, in the US, uh, a first case, the uh, First Amendment Institute versus Trump has confirmed that uh, Trump cannot block users from his Twitter comment section because this has emerged into a, a public sphere and it would be governmental censorship. But what is really important is that national court orders and judgments, when they are well-reasoned and respect the rule of law, need to be respected and implemented by intermediaries. This applies especially to the role of politicians. Uh, in Germany, a number of politicians had their Twitter accounts suspended because of jokes they made uh, in relation to, um, uh, to ballots. Uh, jokes still need to be possible, even if an account is not dedicated to satire. It will be difficult, of course, to uh, ensure how, between automation and, and, and human decision-making, errors are avoided. There will always be errors, there will always be overblocking. But once a court order exists, it doesn't become big intermediaries to not implement them. And to, uh, this, would be, this is blind to their roles in society and supports uh, unfounded fears of online lawlessness. The last time politicians in Germany were unhappy with the practices of social media companies, we got the Network Enforcement Act. Um, I'm not sure we want to find out what the next act will look like. It is always easy to criticize the practices of the big uh, companies like Facebook and Google, from, from, uh, who are right now very active in the US and, uh, and, and Europe, because we know so much about them. But what do you really know about the content moderation standards used by companies like TikTok? A first uh, leak has provided some insights into that, and this has not provided us with a very pretty picture. So yes, let's talk about uh, all intermediary companies and how to improve their accountability. Thank you very much. 
uh, Luisa and then maybe Salue, and I would afterwards like to give the floor again to, for one quick round of questions, if we, um, if we can, please be short, everyone. I would like to come back to the question on how to hold uh, uh, social media companies um, accountable uh, without them being publishers. And I mean, indeed, this is, is the situation that we are in. I mean, looking at the European perspective, uh, through the e-commerce directive, it is recognized that if you are a hosting service provider, you should benefit from a liability exception. It means that you're not liable for the content that you host on behalf of someone else on your platform. Um, this does, however, not mean that you can't responsibilize uh, platforms. Um, because, of course, being liable for content and having responsibilities to do certain specific things, for instance, if you are notified about the existence of a particular piece of illegal content, is different. And I think that those are, are the, the areas where the regulator can, can work through, I mean, either through, through laws or, or through self-regulation. Um, so from that point of view, I think that the balance in the e-commerce directive, which provides this possibility of, of the liability exemption is still very valid. And I mean, we have to remember that for the growth of this sector, I mean, the, I think that this liability exemption has been absolutely crucial. Uh, furthermore, I would like to comment on the issue of, of uh, hate speech against and harassment against journalists. I mean, of course, this is a big problem. Uh, but here again, I think we have to remember that removal of such content is, is not the only remedy here. I mean, first and foremost, uh, we have to make sure that states enforce their laws against the actual offenders online. I mean, when there is real threats against journalists in the online spheres, I mean, it's for the police and the prosecution services to uh, investigate the case and prosecute and sentence uh, should this be necessary. And this is something that we're working very actively with in the EU to ensure that member states uh, enforce the framework decision on racism and xenophobia against the offenders. Removing hate speech online by the platforms is really a complementary measure to this. Thank you. Thank you. So I would like to stress on the, also the importance um, of um, awareness raising, education of the society, um, adequate trainings for governmental officials, but also um, for uh, the reviewers of the um, platforms themselves on how to distinguish between free speech and hate speech, which is a very a complex issue. Uh, we know that there are um, uh, UN standards and international standards, but we know also the complexity of the national context. Um, so it is not an issue of words or images, or it is more, it is more complex than that. So um, the education of the society also, uh, which is the responsibility and the obligation of the um, uh, governments, but also maybe the digital platforms, these big digital platforms have, has, have also the responsibility to contribute to these um, efforts at the national level to educate people, uh, at least about how they are moderating uh, content and how, what are the mechanisms of uh, appeal in place. Um, I think this is also a, an obligation for the digital plat platforms themselves. Um, so the other thing that I would like also to stress um, on is um, we know that um, judiciary system, ju judges at the national level, in the national courts, are, um, their judgment are political judgments. Um, so they are not, um, they lack independence and then, so they are, they are not incorporating human rights standards in their roles and in their work and their judgment. They are rather applying laws um, following the interpretation of these laws by the political um, powers. 
So this, this is why they need, they need also trainings, how they can um, uh, incorporate human rights standards in their, uh, in their work, which is crucial. So the, um, to finish very quickly, so Article 19 has developed this uh, social media council, which is a model, a self-regulatory model uh, for um, social media platforms. And the addition of this self-regulatory voluntary um, mechanism is that uh, it can bring at the national or regional le level the um, main actors and the uh, stakeholders that can have a common understanding um, about the context and they can speak the native language. If not, so having also maybe um, different and multi-regulation um, systems to online content can contribute, in my opinion, to the fragmentation of the internet, which is not the aim. So we would like mm -hmm. to have one internet. So also having different systems of regulations based on the willingness of the different governments, this also will contribute to, to deep inequality, unfortunately. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, to the speakers for their thoughtful and, and very um, useful responses. We have one. Yes. Yes. Can I take? Yeah. We have to be really brief now because we do want to come to some sort of conclusions. May I give the four people who now raise their floor one minute each, please? Thank you. Please go ahead. Um. Hi, so my name is Maria Vlahakis. I work for an organization called Womankind. We're a global women's rights organization. Um, I'll keep it very brief. I think two of the earlier questions highlighted the gendered nature of abuse. I think my colleague from India here and my colleague that talked about harassment of female journalists. So just to make the point that I think you know, women and men experience hate speech differently and other gender identities as well. So just it would be useful to hear from the panel, um, perhaps from Alex in terms of kind of the companies and the platforms, how, well, what more we can do to um, ensure that the response to gendered abuse is actually gendered and that the people perhaps moderating actually have a good understanding of the gendered nature of abuse, but also in terms of policy making, um, how that can be more gendered to ensure that the right solution is in place. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Samuel George. I'm a member of parliament from Ghana. And it gives me great pleasure to join this session. I'm here with the first deputy speaker of Ghana's parliament because this is a very important issue to us in Ghana. Listening to the conversation around the room, I realize that it's extremely European and North American centered. You're actually not looking at the African context. And if we're talking about one world, one net, one vision, and a context doesn't take Africa as an entire continent into perspective, you realize that you're going to have a proliferation of network enforcement laws coming out of Africa. Because when we're looking at hate speech and we're looking at misinformation and the issues of the internet and content and the, the platforms themselves are not compliant to our local laws because basically many of them are based in North America and they would cite the, the First Amendment and freedom of speech. And those things or some of the issues that come up in our continent or on our continent or in our countries infringe on our local rights or our local laws. But then the community engagement standards do not take cognizance of our local laws. And let me be very clear, Ghana is a very, very free country. In fact, we're hosting the next Freedom Online Coalition Conference. So we're very free, very open, respect human rights. However, you need to be mindful of local nuances. When, when you pass your community engagement standards. Because many times, even for law enforcement purposes, when we try to get in touch with the platforms, response time, in Europe I hear 24 hours, and I'm like, wow. Official requests go, and seven days later, there's been not even an acknowledgement of those requests. So then how do we have one world, one net, and one vision? Thank you. Thank you. Um, there was someone, I know you, and someone else was here. Yeah, okay. No. Okay. Okay, my name is, uh, thank you. 
My name is Michael Bauermann. I'm from the Center of Advanced Internet Studies in Germany, and I was on, I want to just add um, an aspect to the possibility of soft remedies to the problem. And uh, if you look at the offline world, how do we uh, get uh, uh, solve the problem of hate speech? Mostly by social norms. And if you look at the mechanism how social norms work in the reality, it's a very complicated mechanism. And I think we are, so we, it's not a surprise that we do not have this mechanism in the uh, internet world. But we have to think and to be, to be creative, to think about possibilities how we can create a context in which the mechanism of social norms can all, all also work in the internet space. And I think today there was nothing in this direction discussed, and I think we have to discuss more in this direction. Thank you. Yes, please, and then you also wanted. Very brief, please. Also, um, um, in Germany, we have a problem with the capacity of the, the staff all around the law court and so on, uh, because uh, they, are <laughs> they have enough, a lot to do with the, uh, with the clan, for instance, the clan crime uh, internationally, like in Germany with the Middle East sector, uh, Lebanese and Turkey and Arabic countries who are emigrant, emigrated to Germany and go back and so on. And in that case, I have heard that many, many uh, of this legal law court scenery uh, move away from this, uh, this work and going, for instance, to, to the stakeholder like, um, like uh, the, the big uh, private uh, companies like KP, KPMG and so on. And so in that case, uh, now it's more work in future what you think that the, the extent, the staff situation in, in the law, law court area, um, that they can also uh, sanction, uh, sanction uh, crime uh, in the internet sphere. Thank you very much. Uh, do we ha did we have one last question over there? Yes, okay. Yeah, sorry. And then one minute each for the speakers. Thank you. Yeah. V very quickly, uh, and I would like uh, to, to make may maybe a connection with uh, one of the previous questions about the gender-specific dimension of, uh, um, of online hate speech, etc. Um, I, uh, and I have a question for the colleague from the European Commission. I understand the code of conduct uh, that was drafted in 2016. Uh, is fairly broad, but um, it does not cover gender-related hate, if I'm correct. Uh, is this something that might be addressed in future in the light of new developments or new awareness of the extent of the problem? Thank you. Good. Who from the speakers would like to respond to any of this with a very brief one minute? Yes, Alex, and then Luisa, I'm sure. Sure, I'll start. Um, just specific to start on the gendered nature of abuse online, I think it's clear, it, this is sort of a, it's a common understanding across the industry and the stakeholders that we work with that this is an ongoing problem across platforms. Um, and so we continue to work on ways to improve both our policies and the ways that we respond to them. Um, we announced earlier this year that we were undertaking a review of our harassment policy on YouTube, and so that's something that folks should look out for. Um, these are certainly issues that come up in the context of that conversation for us. Um, the gentleman from Ghana, uh, point taken. Uh, the ways in which we apply our community guidelines are um, we continue to struggle with ensuring and communicating and demonstrating how we are taking into account local context when we are enforcing our global community guidelines. 
An important way that we um, improve that over time is through programs like our Trusted Flagger program, where we engage with experts on the ground in countries around the world, um, with people who are experts in policy areas where we have community guidelines to help inform us in the way that we do enforcement to ensure that over time we continue to improve in the ways that we think about and understand these problems and the way they manifest around the world. Um, I'll pass. Sorry, I would like to give Ms. Avia a last possibility, but I will first take Louisa. Ms. Avia, if you would like to come back, please be ready for one minute in a moment, but first Louisa. Thank you very much. So I would like to come back to the question about the social norms that are not existent online. I think this is a very, very interesting question. And indeed, I think we lack a lot of understanding of the ecosystem of hate online. Where does it come from? What are the mechanisms that turn people into hate speakers in the online sphere and this kind of online inhibition that seems to fester? Uh, so this is something that we are trying to, uh, to support research in because we think that this is also very important in order to see more kind of sustainable responses to this societal problem. So I think this in itself is a very, very important question to continue discussing. Uh, on the issue of, of uh, gender-based uh, um, gender hate speech, it holds true. The Code of Conduct is very much focused on racist hate speech uh, for the simple reason that the framework decision on racism and xenophobia addresses those grounds. Uh, my colleagues working in the Gender Equality Unit are currently now looking more at how we can work also with the issue of gender. So uh, stay tuned with what the Commission is doing in this field. Uh, they are looking at it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Avia. Yes. So what I wanted to say is that um, in the French law, we, um, we decided to, to protect everything that is within the, the dignity of uh, anyone. So uh, the gender is, uh, is within the framework, but um, also everything that is linked to uh, race, religion, uh, sexual orientation, gender, handicap. So everything that will uh, attack someone not for what they will say because it's not the idea to, to withdraw opinions but uh, because of who they are and that's really the major point of the law is to protect people who are uh, attacked because of uh, who they are. Um, what I wanted also to say uh, maybe also for me as a conclusion point is that Everything I can hear here around this table, but also in the various um, conferences I attended, is the idea that everyone wants to tackle hate speech. But we have to say that statute cause is not an option because there are laws, there is a European directive, uh, the platform should be responsible for not taking the right steps to make sure that everyone is protected. And here we are we all see that it's not working. So there's something to do. There's something, a real action to be taken. And there are national laws. There's one I'm carrying, but there was also a more global action to take. And uh, yes, there is Europe, there is the US, there is the rest of the world. But I guess we now have to address the question, do, you, do we still keep the self-regulation or do we all take our responsibilities? And I think when we see the number of suicidal attempts linked to hate speech, we know we have to take our responsibilities now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to everyone. I think this has been a very, very interesting, interesting discussion. discussion. Uh, <laughs> the microphone is tired, I suppose. Um, I would like to just draw some very brief conclusions that for me myself were important in this discussion. I think a lot of very good points were raised. Clearly in this uh, also last pitch uh, from Ms. Avio, yes, we have to do something. We want to do something all together. What we have done so far is not yet effective. Uh, in what we do, we must keep the, the business model in mind. We must keep in mind that uh, algorithms that do 
play a massive role in content moderation and in the uh, moderation of hate speech are optimized for virality and profit and not for dignity, diversity, and public interest content. Um, we also heard that there is still a problem with the um, limited liability of hosts and the Commerce Directive, and there are discussions of a possible addressing of that. Yes, the Commerce Directive has, of course, um, prompted a lot of growth in this sector, but it has, of course, also really prompted um, a growing problem. So we have to possibly um, also look at that. Uh, finally, I think a point was made that if there is a court judgment and if there is a decision taken by um, government authority, then that, of course, must be implemented. Intermediaries and simply have to do it. We are no longer then asking for the voluntary contributions, but we want them to implement that and, of course, collaborate with law enforcement, which we also heard from, from the European uh, Commission. And on that note, I think collo collaboration in the end, again, is one of the key words. Um, we need to keep in mind that what happens in our context here is going to be copied in other parts of the world, and we need to also keep in mind that we are happy and uh, blessed to be cooperating closely with, with some companies, but that not all companies are, uh, we are cooperating with, and that a lot is happening that we do not yet um, fully understand even. Um, and of course, finally, the role of training and awareness raising, which I think has been absolutely present in all points, and I think this is, if I may end with, from my side, and then I will quickly end over to our uh, co-organizers, but I think training and awareness, this is really something where we all, every single one of us can contribute. We can each speak to the um, to our counterparts and uh, within our networks and we can inform about the different opportunities that exist. Also about the question, which I thought was very good, the point that we have problems in addressing hate speech also in the offline world. Let's uh, be honest that we that hate speech is a problem generally, not just online. Um, and with this, I hand over to uh, Martha. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. I realize I stand between you and lunch, so I will be very brief. Um, mostly just to say thank you very much um, to all of our speakers. Thank you to Charlotta. Uh, thank you to, to Ms. Avia for making uh, the technological system work and also the technical staff here for sorting that out. Um, I just want to conclude by stressing again the importance of taking a human rights-based approach um, to dealing with the problem of uh, hate speech online. Uh, and that in doing so also, it's really important that we put uh, the victims uh, of online hate speech really at the center of the action that we take. Um, and that just as we ought to remember that human rights apply online as much as they do offline, uh, we need to remember also the actions that happen online can have very real offline, real world consequences, and that we need to make sure that we uh, protect and support victims to ensure that they also uh, are able to take advantage um, of all of the possibilities and opportunities that are given by the internet. Uh, so thank you very much um, for participating uh, and enjoy the rest of your IGF.